So what I'm going to talk to you about now is, is this idea of, of how do you um, maximize tumor removal um, and, and how do you protect the gland. And we did talk about that quite a bit yesterday. We'll go into some more detail now. <clears throat> and, um, you know, these are our goals of pituitary surgery, um, eliminating hypersecretion syndromes, reducing mass effect, uh, hopefully getting it all done right the first time so they didn't need additional therapies, <clears throat> restoring our, or preserving gland function, uh, preserving and restoring vision, and avoiding complications. And so these are really our, our charges. And when you think about it, the, the potential complications, there's a long list of potentially terrible things, um, beginning at the top here. And I'm going to really focus on, on hypopituitarism and DI. But these are also what we would consider suboptimal outcomes and, um, you know, an incomplete tumor removal or non-remission. And many of you may see in your practice, those of you that do this a lot, you, you get patients who've had prior surgery. That's about 20% of our, of our uh, cases for adenomas and Rathke's cleft cysts are, um, are redos coming from somewhere else. And um, we see some common themes, and we're going to go through some of those. The other thing is the idea of the wrong diagnosis or the procedure. The patient maybe didn't even need surgery. Someone thought they had Cushing's, but in fact they didn't have Cushing's. And this is a big, this is a big, big issue with all of the obese, hypertensive, diabetic people out there. And they hear about Cushing's and they, they may find someone who really is convincing them based on one or two lab tests and you end up operating on them and you don't do them any favors. You really have to work closely with an endocrinologist to make sure that the diagnosis is real. Wrong approach is another issue, surgery not indicated. And so this idea of collaboration and teamwork is essential. And this is from our old paper from uh, many years ago um, on pituitary centers of excellence and all the people that are needed. And you know, this is just an example of the kind of people, the subspecialists you need, for example, for in a patient with Cushing's disease. So you've got to have this ideally um, to, um, to, to really get to the best outcomes. And of course, as you know, in the operating room, there's many ways to um, get into trouble. Uh, beginning with the patient selection and workup, and again, I'm going to focus on these two areas. Garney is going to talk about some of the other issues, particularly CSF leak and carotid, carotid artery injury. But hopefully you wind up with a successful outcome. So here's an example of how to avoid getting in trouble. So this is a 22-year-old woman with fatigue, headache, and galacteria. She's got a pretty high prolactin. She's got this big cellar thing here. You look at her post gadolinium MRI, the gland really enhances, or, or the, the mass enhances very homogeneously, and you go, hmm, this was read as a pituitary adenoma. Um, is it a prolactinoma? Well, it's actually not. And the key here is that there's no differential enhancement. And this is why you've got to pay such close attention to the imaging here. This is actually a case of primary hy hypothyroidism with gland hypertrophy. So the gland is just big and fat because the patient's thyroid gland is not working well. So this is a real trap. And so she went on levothyroxine, and look at that, just a nice normal pituitary gland size. So avoid that. What about this, a prolactinoma? This is a guy who comes in with a bitemporal visual field defect. His prolactin's over 8,000. He's got clearly NOSP grade four invasion. Should we just go in and take that out? He's, his vision has been deteriorating very slowly over months. Now, if he said his vision had been deteriorating over, over a few days, that would be a different story. But So we put him on Dostinex. That's eight weeks of Dostinex, cabergoline. And that's uh, a bit longer, but I, I think that's way better than any of us could do surgically. So again, you got to work closely with your endocrinologist. Remember, first-line therapy for most prolactinomas, unless they're having an apoplectic event, is medical therapy. And that's the kind of result you're going to get in 85 to 90 percent of patients. And that's the, the plummeting of the prolactin that occurs on cabergoline. So just, just remember that. So be certain of the diagnosis, especially in Cushing's and prolactinomas. In terms of uh, imaging, uh, you've really got to appreciate the gland distortion and the location of the posterior lobe. We talked about this some yesterday with the case. Determine if the tumor invades the cavernous sinuses, skull base, or has super diaphragmatic extension. So here's, remember, look on the non-contrast uh, coronal and axial images. Find the posterior lobe and appreciate where it is. It's that high signal. Appreciate how the gland's distorted and that sometimes the gland will be pushed anteriorly. 
and then look for cavernous sinus invasion. And then some of these oddball tumors like this one, which I uh, will we'll talk about maybe on Sunday, that has super diaphragmatic extension. These are really challenging adenomas and are in some ways a different beast. And then with Rathke's cleft cyst, remember the gland, and most of them, the, 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 the gland is going to be pushed forward, and you're going to go through the gland to get to the cyst. So strategizing uh, for, for maximizing your tumor removal, uh, wide sphenoidotomy and cellar exposure. Use the Doppler as a guide uh, to get out toward the cavernous sinus. You saw we did that yesterday. Remove infiltrated dura. And start removing the tumor inferiorly and allow the tumor to descend. Um, you can partially excise or, or mobilize attenuated gland, and I'll show you an example of that. Try to do a pseudocapsular dissection. Um, you got to explore the folds of the diaphragm and determine if that descent is complete. Um, and then open the medial cavernous sinus where t tumor leads you. And again, this is, a, this is where you really need the Doppler, you need navigation, cranial nerve monitoring, and you need some experience uh, doing this. So uh, this is the opening that you want. You want to use the Doppler. You saw how useful that was yesterday. This is what happens uh, when you don't uh, have a good exposure. This is a post-operative MRI on this patient here. That's a fat graft, and that was the removal that they did. And obviously, they, they probably didn't use navigation. And when we went back in, the sphenoid os on the right was virgin. This is the keel of the sphenoid. This is a very old image, but it makes the point. They did the entire operation through this little sphenoidotomy, and... Um, they did, this was their bony exposure where the fat graft is, so this was the appropriate bony exposure here. And so if you're trying to do this through two little openings, you're never going to get the tumor out, and I'm sure none of you would ever do that, okay? So, um, important point. The pseudocapsular dissection, the pseudocapsule is just a compressed rim of normal gland, and Ed Oldfield worked this out in excruciating detail and beautifully showed it in several papers and in some of his surgical videos. And using this technique in Cushing's, he had an incredibly high um, remission rate, 98%. So it's a very useful technique, but beware of the anatomical realities. You know, on the flip side is with larger tumors, um, and this has all been worked out uh, really nicely um, by Engelbert Nosp, and you're all familiar with this grading scale. And really with the highly invasive tumors, NOS grade, particularly 3B and 4, the remission rates are very, are very low. And you can see this is, this is endocrinologic remission here. In the NOS grade 3A and 3B and 4, it drops precipitously 0% in the 3B and the 4. So you need to be aware of that, and you have to decide how aggressive you want to be. When... Uh, um, Ed Oldfield and John Jane compared their outcomes. You know, if you think the endoscope is a game changer, um, it is in a lot of ways, but in, in acromegaly, they had the exact same results in this paper published back in, in JCEM in 2013. And these are two highly, highly experienced um, surgeons. Ed Oldfield was using the microscope. John Jane was using the endoscope, but really no difference in, in endocrinologic recovery. And if you read the, the uh, Endocrine Society guidelines, <clears throat> they basically encourage, you know, don't, don't be too aggressive. Cavernous sinus invasion in indicates tumor that is likely surgically unresectable. And they, uh, the, from the endocrine side, they, they tend to discourage that. But I think what we've seen is this, ch this is changing a little bit. And so this is a, a paper from the, the Japan group from Dr. Yamada. And, and his colleagues, and they showed cavernous sinus invasion in a little bit of over a third of patients with acromegaly, um, and they confirmed that, but they had an overall remission rate using modern criteria of 85%. That's, that's pretty good. And with cavernous sinus invasion of almost 70%. So we do think the endoscope is helping, but it needs to be done uh, judiciously. And they had no new permanent cranial neur neuropathy. Is Juan here yet? Juan Fernandez? No. So Juan is going to talk about this when he comes, and I really think this is pushing the envelope. This is a, a beautiful paper that um, he published with, his, uh, with the group with Paul Gardner and Carl Schneiderman, the group at UPMC. This is a great paper if you haven't read this. They again showed 37% with cavernous sinus invasion. They mapped out these different compartments, the inferior compartment, superior, posterior, um, some beautiful videos or beautiful images. But again, you can see with the, 
The uh, gross total resection rates were pretty high in the superior, posterior, and inferior, but of course very low in the lateral compartment. And they did have some complications. And so again, I think this is, it is pushing the envelope and you have to be uh, careful and you have to decide how aggressive you want to be when you have medical therapy like octreotide, lanreotide, and you have radiation for some of these patients. But we are continuing to push forward on this. And then this is some data I just got from Andrew Little. A number of us are involved in the transfer study. This is a prospective study um, looking at the um, uh, evaluation of surgical resection. for these. This was in non-functioning tumors. And just to cut to the chase here, this is 221 patients at seven pituitary centers. Many of you are in the room here or are, have been participating in this. Gross total resection was 81% overall. And if the goal was gross total resection, it was almost 90%. And if it was subtotal, it was still 64%. So this is pretty high. This is unpublished. It'll be published fairly soon. But then when they looked at the multivariate model, the, the most important predictors was the goal gross total resection. That was predictive. If there was a lower NOS grade, not too surprising, grades 0, 1, and 2. And if the tumor size was less than 3 centimeters. So, you know, this all makes sense. And I think we're doing better with the endoscope, um, with the functional tumors that, that remains to be seen. So um, just again, to, to go through some of these things, um, we're going to, when you're, when you're taking the tumor out, uh, you want to reduce mass effect early on for the large tumors. You should incise um, uh, or partially incise or excise attenuated normal gland. Avoid wandering into the posterior lobe. If you have a very large dead space, we, we reconstruct with fat, and I think that may help put, uh, minimize traction on the infundibulum. In our series, and this is, uh, data is, is older now, but you can see that the, the risk of new pituitary failure is very, very size dependent, and that's been borne out in the transfer study as well. Um, but so for tumors with, uh, that are less than 2 centimeters, the risk of new hypopituitarism should be less than, than 2%. But there's some times where it's just, I think it's going to happen no matter what. This is a giant adenoma. You can see the normal pituitary gland is draped over this. This is a patient with borderline hypopituitarism. And you have this large excursion of the gland, almost four centimeters, going from here to here and much more traction. This patient wound up with postoperative uh, panhypopituitarism, including, including DI. And um, that, that may be hard to, to prevent. This is a paper that uh, Garney and I did. Garney was the lead author in this on this gland incision technique, and we've showed that this is very uh, safe to excise part of the gland as long as you don't take too much, and it really can help provide you good access to the tumor. So let me just show some examples here uh, quickly. So here's a large tumor. You can see that the, um, the, the gland is draped over the tumor. It's a little bit more to the right here. Um, and you can see uh, this, is, this is gland here. This is pseudocapsule, and this is gland. So this is all gland here, very attenuated, very thinned out. So we're going to cut the gland here down low to allow us to get more to the tumor down, down below here. And again, look at how pale the gland is now, but over time it will, it will start to beef up and become more hyperemic. And so we're rolling this up a little bit, uh, knowing that most of the, the, the good gland is over here on the right, and then coming just coming into the tumor and taking out the lower pole. And I think that takes the pressure off the gland immediately, and you'll start to see, um, you'll start to see the gland thicken up. And this is where we have most of the tumor out now. You can see the, the sort of dimpling and the folding in of the, of the gland and the diaphragma over here and then looking with the 30 degree scope and working through these folds very carefully to try and make sure that you've got all the, all the tumor out. And you, you should use the 30 and the zero degree to make sure that you get a, you get a good look. And so one of the things you, you can judge based on the, on the preoperative MRI is how far the diaphragm should come down. So a tumor like this, it will come down about a third. It'll look like that immediately after surgery. Um, and with a tumor where you've got half of the tumor above the level of the diaphragm, you should get a complete herniation 
of the gland and the diaphragm down to the bottom of the cella, so something like that. And if you don't see that happening, you know you're probably leaving tumor behind in the folds. And this is just that patient there, post-up day one, you can see the fat graft. This is three months, this is nine months, and you can see this is a functional gland here. So um, sometimes, uh, even in uh, large, large patients with uh, large, large tumors, they're, they're not very hard to remove. This is obviously a, a young man with gigantism. And um, this was his post-operative scan coming from somewhere else. And um, this was very straightforward, and he, he's been in remission now for years. Now here's another example of a patient uh, with acromegaly um, with very high levels of uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone. And you can see that this patient um, has, hang on, let me just go back here. You can see that this patient has uh, cavernous sinus invasion, both in the inferior and the posterior cavernous sinus. You can see this here in the posterior cavernous sinus and in the inferior cavernous sinus here. So this is a patient where you're probably not going to get them into remission. So um, here using, this is the Doppler here. Now, this is a tumor, again, that was very soft and did not lend itself well to a pseudocapsular dissection. And I'm just going to go, you can see here how it's very, very much just falling apart. And this is very typical with acromegaly. They, they often don't have a lot of, super, they do many times, but they often extend into the sphenoid. You can see here we're back at the, at the back of the cella here. And um, here we're starting to get into this uh, cavernous sinus defect right here. And again, trying to get all of this tumor out, uh, the, the easy tumor that's more on the right side and on, on, the, on the gland, on the undersurface of the gland. And now you can see this large defect here. And so we're using uh, monitoring. This is a large defect. This is the carotid here. And this is this defect going back into the, into the um, posterior cavernous sinus. And we're starting to get firing on, on cranial nerve 6. And I think that's the real danger here if you look cranial nerve 6 coming up here, and we'll see this in the, in the, in the lab. And uh, you have to make a judgment call. How aggressive do you want to be? This is a lot of posterior cavernous sinus invasion, um, and you really want to try and, and get all this and potentially give the patient a 6 nerve palsy. And so um, we, we went as far as we could. The tumor got more and more fibrous back here, and then, and then we, we stopped. We used the peroxide again. And um, you can see the post-op here, most of the tumor is gone, but of course there's tumor here in the posterior cavernous sinus. We got most of the stuff along the inferior cavernous sinus, but this is the residual. And the patient eventually went on somatuline and, and has been in, in remission. Cushing's disease, um, you know, the, the key again here, I think, is, is making the accurate diagnosis. These are many of the, the, uh, the leaders of the field here. Um, who you all know, Ed Laws, uh, Charlie Wilson, and Ed Oldfield. So this is a 32-year-old woman, classic history, very high urinary free cortisols, high ACTH, really fit the bill. She had an identifiable adenoma, which is really a good, a good thing when you can see them, because you know in about a quarter of the cases you're not going to be able to see the adenoma. And so... Um, that's, uh, that makes it much more challenging to have to explore the gland here. So you can see here, we're using a 30 degree scope after we've made a little incision in the gland, and we're using, again, this pseudocapsular technique coming around the tumor progressively and trying to preserve that pseudocapsule. And these func small functional tumors, this is really, really uh, helpful. And, uh, and I think it's associated with a, with a higher rate of remission. Uh, as Ed Oldfield has shown. And the gland tolerates this manipulation very well here. You can start to see the capsules breaking up a little bit. Um, and then eventually you have to start to remove some of the tumor because otherwise you're going to uh, uh, put too much, too much pressure on the gland and trying to get around it and, and you'll distort the gland or the stalk. So here we're starting to take it out piecemeal once we've gotten around the majority of it. And I think here's where the endoscope really, really helps. So in this case, once we're getting to the back of the tumor here, this is the posterior lobe. So this is the interface with the posterior lobe right there. And that's a view that's, this view looking up is very hard to get with the microscope. 
and you can see going all the way up um, and then the peroxide. So she's been in remission and that's her post-op. So that's a, pr a pretty straightforward Cushing's case. This is not a straightforward Cushing's case. This is a woman that we had operated on before, had also been operated on elsewhere. She had um, these um, uh, hearing aid implants and could not get an MRI and she recurred again and we couldn't really see where the tumor was but we thought based on her prior imaging it was probably in the cavernous sinus. So we're actually opening the medial cavernous sinus wall here and, um, and finding tumor. And so these are very challenging cases and you really have to decide, you know, is it the right thing to do or not. You can see the cavernous sinus bleeding which is very controllable um, in, in most cases, unless, of course, you injured the carotid artery. Um, and uh, she went into remission. Now, I, I suspect it will be uh, relatively short-lived, but she's in remission. Um, and if she comes out of remission, at that point, you would do uh, radiation, potentially adrenalectomies, and work closely with your endocrinologist. But you can see that um, this sort of exploration of the cavernous sinus uh, can, can be done. A little bit of, yeah. And that cavernous sinus bleeding stops very easily. Um, finally, on Rathke's, I think I'll skip this because I think Garney's going to talk about Rathke's cleft cysts anyway. Um, but in general, with Rathke's, it's a low vertical incision. And you, you want to just take the cyst out. We try not to strip the lining. If you try to strip the lining, you may wind up um, uh, leaving the patient with DI or new gland function. So simple, simple drainage. So um, really important to have your team of experts, um, particularly with, with ENT and endocrinology. Um, careful patient selection, know and review the anatomy, respect the carotids, um, wide exposure, and make all attempts to preserve and restore a gland function. Uh, thank you very much.